Thank you very much. That will not be just two of us. Uh, I will also <laughs> ask uh, the other uh, panelists to join uh, the panel. And we have uh, uh, Camille Francois. She is an uh, intelligence director and graphica, and she leads a team of scientists that uh, tries to, through data perspective, uh, see uh, the manipulation on uh, social media. And uh, Kerr Giles, who is the senior consulting fellow at Chatham House and the research director at Conflict Studies Research Center, but whom I know as the great Russian expert, technology expert, and the person that traditionally thinks ahead of a curve. I always uh, taken the pleasure of reading his pieces because that kind of alludes to what is upcoming. So uh, thank you, thank you, Alex, for the great talk. And we all had a chance to hear the Facebook's perspective on the problem. And I have to say, I'm really thrilled to hear that because I think three years ago that would have been rather unimaginable. Uh, but a lot of things were unimaginable three years ago. I yeah. Think, yes. So <laughs> world is moving. That is a great thing. Uh, uh, but I think that is uh, also very valuable to have a different perspectives on, on, on the same problem set. And I always, when I see the problems, what we are, uh, we are facing today within the election, within the social processes, I ask myself a question. Is it a technical problem or is it a human problem? Is it the platform? Is it the society? Is it more regulation? Is it more freedom? And that is why I think we have to discuss here in this panel, obviously not always having the all right choices, but I think that is a debate that we have to enhance in our societies. With that, care if I can ask you, share your points. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In my home country, in the United Kingdom, I'm occasionally asked to appear before parliamentary committees that are conducting inquiries, looking into government policy and how that policy is implemented by ministries. And a lot of the time, although those inquiries are supposed to be about oversight of government, what they actually look like is post-mortems for looking at how policy went so badly wrong. A lot of people over the last few days have said to me, doesn't this panel look a little bit like a post-mortem? Isn't it a little bit late to be thinking about security of social media against malign influence when so much bad things has already happened? Or as the Register put it a few days ago when talking about the election security measures that Facebook has now put into place, the horse may be a distant speck on the horizon, but at least now somebody is putting a bolt on the stable door. Personally, I disagree. I think this is an excellent moment to take stock of what has happened so far and what can be done about it. Because what we've seen so far is not the end of the story. There are bigger and nastier threats in this area coming over the hill. But I do ask myself, why are we calling this a cybersecurity issue? Alice has laid out exactly how the, the fake news and malign influence ecosystem on his own platform looks and what is being done about it. But I don't think most of those are a cybersecurity challenge, even in the broad catch-all definition that we heard from Thomas Hendrik Ilves earlier. Because in the great majority, the problems we're facing here are not about breaking or breaking into a system. They're not about attacking components. They're not about hacking. Yes, sometimes they're cyber assisted. A cyber can be included as part of a broader campaign. And Camille is going to be talking later on about, for example, dissemination of material that is obtained by hacking. And also there are related issues. Alex has pointed out elsewhere that local election officials around the world need help for a situation they are entirely unprepared for, where they are protecting their systems against nation state attacks. But on the platforms themselves, it's not attacks against technical systems, but attacks against human knowledge and opinion and intention, and that is a very different thing. It's instrumentalizing social media platforms as a weapon against the host society by playing by their own rules, using the systems of, for example, Facebook, as they were designed to be used. The Internet Research Agency using custom audiences and targeting tools and doing things that even in the United States at the time were not even illegal. Alex described this uh, at the beginning of the month at F8 as technically correct use of our products to cause harm. So it's not a cyber issue, then what is it? And to my mind, it is an ethical issue. 
The debate over carrier responsibility for content has really remained unchanged since the early 1990s. Who exactly is responsible for policing what is posted on the internet? The first content aggregators and media companies that emerged onto the internet found exactly this problem and this debate has never gone away. The underlying problem is the perception that these corporations are public utilities and are provided for the public good, but they're not designed as such. They are designed instead to make profits for their shareholders. If we're thinking about the instrumentalization of social media, I think it's useful to consider cyberspace as being like airspace. In both domains, military operations are a small subset of the overall much bigger civil traffic. And when delivering effects, when delivering hostile effects, they're doing so usually in strictly defined combat zones. But in cyberspace, the social media giants are the publicly available services like the airlines. Consider weaponizing airlines against the country through whose airspace they're flying. If the result is a 9-11, then the response by nation states in terms of strict enforcement of security and strict regulation is swift and the need is clear. But what happens when the damage is less clearly defined, when there's been no breaking of rules, no hijacking, no deviation from flight paths, when in effect the hostile actors are just using your own system as they were intended to be used. In that situation, why do we assume that it is the responsibility of the social media platforms themselves to fix the problem? Strictly speaking, there is no a priori obligation on social media platforms to take steps to prevent use within the parameters of legitimate behavior according to their rules to subvert political processes or to attack social cohesion. You, put, you could put this under the bracket of corporate social responsibility towards governments and towards nation states, towards users, towards democracy overall. There is a clear moral and ethical obligation, but certainly not a statutory one. But also it is in the company's interests themselves. Attacks like these are not only, as Alex said, attacks on Facebook's ideals, but they are attacks on the systems and the governments and the values and the society in which these social media platforms have thrived and which allow them to continue to grow. If they do not wish to be exploited by nations and by groups that if they would, if they could, once they had served their purpose, would eventually control them or shut them down according to the pattern that we have seen in, for example, Russia, then it is in their interests to arrest these processes. The problems we're facing are often focused down to social media accounts that are not being tied to any real identity, allowing impersonation or operating en masse under uh, the control of a single individual or group. And in my position, I increasingly hear calls that we previously only heard from authoritarian regimes that there should, in effect, be a ban on, anim on anonymity, that there should be verifiable ID for anybody who is operating on the internet. Now, the steps that have been taken so far, they do include requirements for the political and issue ads in sub-administrations to be labeled with a paid-for-by disclosure. I think the implementation of that is going to be closely watched by everybody on both sides because Russia and the Soviet Union before it, and let's not forget that the techniques we're seeing being employed against Western democracies now are based on long-standing principles of how Moscow fights the West. They've always known that if you wish to set up a, an organization to subvert democratic processes in the United States, then it needs to be established in the United States, and it needs to be called the All-American Patriotic League of Defenders of Democracy in this great nation of ours. <laughs> so, anybody that only clicks on the first link, and let's not forget this is only the tiny proportion of social media users that actually take a critical interest in who is talking to them, will be none the wiser as to who is influencing. Implementation is absolutely key. Now, in this context, we often hear recommendations to follow the Estonian model of having a verifiable and reliable online identity that you can use. I like that. If I, if I plug this in, everybody knows that it's me, and that is incredibly helpful. I like the fact that this enables me to do business more easily. I am irked by the fact that by comparison with this, if I am doing business, engaging in banking, doing contracts, working with government in my own country, it feels archaic and antiquated. If I try to do it in the United States, it feels positively medieval by comparison with the Estonian <laughs> model. But 
I don't want to be known all the time. Anonymity on the internet is a fundamental aspect of privacy and a fundamental right which I think needs to be protected. It is important that at times on the internet people really do not know that you're a dog. It's vital that parody accounts like, for example, Darth Putin KGB on Twitter should be allowed to operate and to thrive with, a, with that first line of protection against the hostile consequences, personal consequences that, are, that result from speaking truth to power, that level of protection that is provided by anonymity. So let us not do away with it. The second key issue is the problem of radicalization and the fact that people do radicalize in closed groups of like-minded people. And of course, social media compartments present a spectrum of varying degrees of being open and closed to outside inspection in which radical ideas can thrive. On one end, you have Twitter echo chambers, which are open to the and visible to the outside world. Somewhere in the middle, you have subreddits, which are nearly always open to the public and closely moderated and routinely banned when they get to extremists. And then at the far end, you have Facebook groups, almost by default closed until detected and making a convenient dark alleyway for gatherings for extremist ideas. Now, none of these spaces by default make us better or worse people, but they polarize by affirming existing beliefs and behaviors, by presenting a version of reality in our own filter bubble or echo chamber that comforts us or enrages us or sometimes comforts us by enraging us. But either way, it creates a space where we can pretend that everything is as we would like it to be and everything we would like to believe is true. And that, by definition, makes the most fertile ground for hostile information operations. If you have a look at the EU Disinfo Lab report on hostile efforts against the Italian elections recently, they said because of the accessibility of Twitter data, disinformation agents tended to use platforms where there are almost no possibilities of being exposed, Facebook being one of those platforms. And as Alex said a moment ago, it provides a method for tapping into receptive audiences for redistributing the hostile content. But there are two further implications. First of all, that compartmentalization, it undermines still further the assumption of a shared basis of established facts in our societies, where the real nature of events that are in the recent past and in common memory, for example, from my own line of work, the shooting down of MH17 or the nerve agent attack in Salisbury that President Kalilite referred to this morning, or chemical attacks in Douma in Syria, the known facts about them have to be restated and reproved even to national news media over and over again. And secondly, the opposition has the resources to move in these spaces and sow the seeds of radicalization or of calls to action or subversion, including, importantly, operating with freedom in the local languages even if they do not master them. That refers both to nation states with a broad-based approach to conducting subversion and throwing resources at every individual little pocket they can find and to single issue campaigns which can focus their efforts on a specific group of people that they want to influence. If tech companies are to police this, then they need the resources to counter these determined campaigns by that spectrum of actors, by hostile actors, up to and including nation states. But again, critically, it requires that capability to act in local languages. Now, we say all of this at the, mind, at the moment with hindsight. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. With hindsight, of course, it would have been easy, so easy to detect and prevent preparations for 9-11 to disrupt the course of events that led to the rise of Islamic State, etc., etc. But I and other people in my profession cannot help asking ourselves, what would have happened if people in Alex's position had in November 2015, a year before the US presidential elections, seen the report that came out from Yanis's center about the next phase of Russian information operations, the next phase of Russian information warfare, and said to themselves, I do not wish my company to be used as a weapon by Russia against my country. What steps would they have taken? Well, we've seen some of them outlined in the case of Facebook by Alex just now, but what would have happened across other platforms, across Twitter, YouTube, Facebook's own Instagram? All of it would have been dependent not only on the platform's own understanding of the threat, but also understanding of their own systems and how they could be exploited 
with harmful intent. Once again at F8 at the beginning of the month, um, Alex pointed out there was no playbook for dealing with election security issues. There was no, no rules to follow in these situations. And so Facebook worked hard to understand exactly what had happened in the United States in 2016 to make sure it didn't happen again. But if weaponization of their platforms took the social media companies by surprise, what other surprises are waiting for us down the track? What is actually going to happen in the next phase of development of hostile actor capabilities? What, for example, will be the social media response to well-organized deepfake attacks? Just to take one example of an information campaign that much to everybody's surprise, we haven't seen yet. The platforms ought to have all the information they need to combat the organized spread of disinformation by external hostile actors, because the most toxic sources are well known. The organizers of the activities are also known, and the reasons why they're doing it are also well known. With all this information and all this knowledge, identifying some forms of suspicious activity and countering it ought to be trivial. For instance, the tackling of the organized spread of one and the same link by weird accounts with no real history. Other countermeasures do take resources, for example, driving down the time taken by the platforms to respond to reports of abuse. None of this looks hard if the platforms consider it to be a problem. But the front line for this work still appears to be a patchwork of government organizations and NGOs, and in some cases, dedicated individuals across Europe and North America. There's long been a recognition of the need for groups like this to pool and share their efforts in order not only to remove duplication of effort, but also to augment their capabilities for countering online subversion or even just for measuring its effect in the first place, because none of these conversations are useful unless we have the metrics of what hostile activity actually works, and therefore at what we should need to direct resources in order to protect our societies. All of these organizations have been set up in the assumption of no cooperation from the social media platforms. And at present, despite what Alex has just said about the, the will to share with academia, that assumption in many cases still remains valid. But if the platforms themselves can share the threat picture, especially when they find out how they see the threat developing and evolving now that they are aware of it, then non-governmental actors do not have to rely on deeply flawed and incomplete tools for assessing what is really happening in social media space and what the next threat is going to look like. Again, the argument is clear if the social media platforms consider this to be a problem and a threat. But that's not the end of the story. We do also need to look beyond the five meter target and beyond the bright shiny object of what is currently in the news about malign influence and the headlines from elections and subversion over the last year and a half and the realization of Russian intentions and ask how much worse can it get. Social media abuse has our attention at the moment but is only one element of Russian hostile ambition against the United States and the West in general using cyber and infowar capabilities as a weapon. To me, that argues a failure of deterrence in cyberspace where the only break on escalation at the moment is the reluctance of US and allies to respond publicly to being under attack. But the networks that were being set up and the capabilities that were being stockpiled in 2014 and 2015 that have not been exposed and removed as part of the election countermeasures campaign are still there. And the ongoing progressive, aggressive probing of vulnerabilities in cyberspace and physical infrastructure is still carrying on. None of this has gone away, and that is the context in which we need to see, for example, the VPN filter malware attack that's been disclosed over the last few days. So we may be worried about the effects of malign influence on social media, but let's not forget that in terms of the potential for damage against our nations and our societies, we've not seen anything yet. Thank you, Kerr. Uh, thank you very much for the sobering analysis. And I happen to agree that actually we're right now doing an analysis of the yesterday. And uh, today and tomorrow is coming and some of the uh, technological advances that are to be brought about and the way they can be used, I think, are pretty, pretty profound deep fake ability to use big data at a sort of was by more different actors, I think that is something we have to embrace for. Um, 
but also one factor I would also bring up. The only way one can respond to this situation is a by combination of governments, non-governmental organizations, media, and companies working together. That is a different, difficult thing to muster, but that is the only way to uh, go around it. Camille, uh, can I ask you, we've been sort of, at least typically in the media, uh, it has been written technology is the one that is the culprit of a problem which I think uh, at least Kerr said it's not the case, probably. Uh, but can we also see the way we can use technology to address the issue? Are you asking me to add a positive note to these <laughs> remarks? Sure. That's really what you're doing. <laughs> not um, so subtle, was it? <laughs> I will. Uh, but right before I hop into a, a few things, I, I want to um, add to what you just said, Kerr, on how long did it take us to wake up to what was going on? And therefore, by focusing uh, not only on, on the US campaign, uh, how much of yesterday's threat are we really considering as we're preparing to uh, fight ongoing battles in the information space? And that makes me realize that personally, the first time I read about an institution based in St. Petersburg called the IRA, running a network of fake sites designed to influence a foreign audience uh, was probably late 2014. Uh, the first open source investigations, I read about it, uh, in, in the open media were probably beginning of 2015. Uh, there was a great network of investigative journalists, human rights activists, who had uh, taken upon themselves to go investigate information manipulations done by these St. Petersburg-based uh, groups. And they had published some of their data and some of their techniques. Uh, it was the first, uh, uh, I think, the first site on Global Voices website. Uh, it was used by reverse engineering uh, the Google Analytics code that were used on some of these websites to demonstrate there was really a coordinated uh, network of them. And so indeed, I, I can't help but wonder uh, why we, uh, as a, you know, why, why the technology industry uh, wasn't able to detect that signal better uh, earlier and then to prepare a playbook and adapt these rules, as you said, Alex, to think about where we actually don't really have clear rules and a clear playbook to address that. And I think there's a lot more that can be done so that we have a better ear on the ground uh, and we operate closer to scholarly debates, to the human rights community and to investigative journalists that are often giving the first signal on that. Um, okay, I wanted to add to uh, uh, the question you asked on, uh, is this a cybersecurity problem? Uh, manipulations of social media, is it simply uh, actors using the services as uh, it was intended, but simply to cause harm? Or are we seeing a new intersection of uh, cyber operations and information operations that we don't fully comprehend yet, or both? And I want to talk a little bit more about this uh, set of attacks that are really cyber enabled and that are uh, cyber operations meeting uh, media manipulations. And roughly uh, three main things come to mind. The first thing is, uh, as, as we briefly touched upon, this false leaks te technique. So uh, this is very much the, the DNC hack, uh, Alex, that you showed. Uh, it's very much what happened in the case of the Macron leaks. Uh, but it also appeared a little bit earlier. Uh, it was what happened in the case of the doping leaks uh, against WADA in 2016. And so it's also interesting to, to look at how these techniques first appear and evolve. And uh, this is a quite uh, sophisticated but basic process in which you have a, a capable adversary who um, compromises accounts and information, usually by a phishing attack. Then the stolen information is presented as a leak. Uh, if we're going to get upset about uh, misuse of terms, that will be my one pet peeve. Those are not leaks. This is a stolen data, stolen information. And so you present that as a, as a leak, uh, as Alex said, with the intent of uh, appearing as a neutral organization. Sometimes these leaks, uh, 
leaked, false leaks are uh, falsified. So you may add uh, fake emails, for instance, to your stash. And then after that, uh, you start seeing uh, adversaries pitching these stories to media, uh, either quite directly. So some journalists have reported uh, receiving messages saying, hi, we're a group, small little group called Fancy Bear. We have fun info for you to report on. Would you take that story? Uh, so that still worked uh, a couple years ago. Now uh, uh, it seems that uh, adversaries are using more sophisticated techniques where uh, they don't claim to be uh, the source of the hacking. Uh, but this is sort of like the false leaks uh, uh, technique, and I think it, it demonstrates quite uh, clearly the intersection between cyber operations and information operations with the cyber-enabled uh, media manipulation. The other thing that we are uh, seeing as an emerging trend is um, malware distributed on social media by these fake accounts and bots. And so a recent example was in Turkey during a protest in July 2017, in which you had fake personas participating to uh, the online movement, to the protest, and distributing a link which pretended to be the official website for the protest and was uh, actually infected with malware. And so as we see sort of the growth of where these uh, media manipulations are going, I think distributing malware directly through fake personas and bots is definitely going to be one leg of it. The last elements that comes to mind when I reflect upon how much of a cyber security problem media manipulation is becoming is, of course, the underlying market behind it. Um, I first met a propaganda hacker, uh, same thing, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, and he was pitching his services as a propaganda hacker for uh, election manipulation. And he was saying, you know, pick your opponent, I will hack into their campaign schedule, I will hack into their emails, and then we will create a great army of uh, fake profiles on multiple platforms, uh, and we will disseminate the information uh, that uh, you don't want. And when they have a campaign rally, we will also use our army of fake profiles and bots to make sure that their hashtag becomes unusable, so hashtag poisoning. And this underlying market goes from uh, these hackers, so the black, black market part of it, to really above board uh, and then the gray area in between. So black PR firms are also an important piece of the puzzle there. Um, but I know you want me to have like a, a positive note on, on <laughs> what do we do in the middle of that mess. Um, and I think one thing that we should discuss and push for is the need for more cooperation, both, as we said, between non-governmental actors, platforms, uh, scholars, researchers, and media, but also in between platforms. I think uh, Alex is there, and it's fantastic to have Facebook uh, detail their policies and what to do about it, but this is not a one-platform problem. Um, it isn't played by adversaries as a one-platform problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find it confusing that all current platforms that are being affected by these sophisticated media manipulation attempts all have very different policies, rules, playbook to address that. I think it adds vulnerabilities more than it helps us tackle them. And pushing for more cooperation in the way we can leverage technology to protect people's ability to use social media to organize, to discuss politics, to circulate free speech, to s circulate popular and unpopular ideas, is going to have to be an industry-wide effort, but a possible one. <laughs> <laughs> How? Would the uh, cyber NATO of uh, President Ilves have to be enlarged to the companies? I think Alex touched upon data sharing. That's, that's an interesting example, right? So if you look at the more sophisticated false profiles, right, they're not necessarily easy to detect. Uh, they're not a bot, right? So it's not like an automated profile that would treat every five seconds with two followers and 
or, or you know, two following 20,000 followers and, and a network of amplification. Um, the sophisticated false profiles that we saw at work in 2016 are both difficult to detect and difficult to unplug. So in the case of uh, the campaign against the US elections, when some, of these, when some of these false profiles have been detected, they have been turned off on multiple platforms. And as a result, uh, their audience that had been catered and created and encouraged for many months uh, was upset and started saying, wait, where is, I'm gonna use a, well, I'm, I'm gonna use a fake name, right? Jenna, where is Jenna? I was following her and, you know, I was following her on Twitter and on Facebook and suddenly she's no longer there and I'm getting this weird message saying that apparently I interacted with a Russian campaign, what's going on? And then of course, you know, these profiles reappear on their own websites that are not uh, hosted on these platforms saying, hey, uh, there was an article in the press saying that I was a Russian troll, uh, this is outlandish, uh, follow me on Telegram, we're gonna have a lot of fun there. And so if you take this as a use case, right, uh, the case for better cooperation goes from, okay, how do we uh, help each other, help platforms, help journalists, uh, help civil society members identify and understand these false profiles, right? First on the detection step, how do you communicate that to the media? I think it's also very upsetting for the media because some of them have been tricked into covering what these false profiles were doing. Uh, and not just the political media, right? We're talking about profiles, for instance, who are very active commenting the life of the Kardashian, because that works to build an audience in America. And so therefore the profiles who have been covered by pop culture, right? So how do you explain that to the media? How do you have this conversation? How do you explain that back to your users and your citizen? So here on this small use case, you have a case for cooperation from detection to handling the different uh, components of who needs to be uh, informed. And then mitigation, right? What do you do so that these actors cannot just turn around and create another false profile that's going to take months and months to detect, and then once you detect it, has an audience that has been engaging with them for months and months and is very upset when you turn them off. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, sometimes I think actually we've been too obsessed with a thinking what the other party is doing instead of thinking what we should be doing. I sometimes kind of uh, think that we people actually like to be manipulated. Ever been to the illusionist show? Well, you kind of know they're manipulating you, but you like it and probably you come back to it. So in a way, one has to always remember that, in my view, it is also about the people and their ability to actually understand that being manipulated at the end of a road mm -hmm. might feel entertaining, but might be a problem. Alex, can I now turn to you? Um, first, I would say splendid presentation. I would have loved to see more transparency from Facebook, and uh, I would say, more of that would be good, at least, I would say, from a European sense. But I was struck by one point you've said. 99% of what happens on Facebook is a positive transactions, and one is a malign. Uh, um, actually, I believe I'm probably in the wrong echo chamber. It feels a bit di in a different balance point for me uh, in the way I see it in, in Facebook. But one practical question. Uh, we, as a center, do run our own machine. Well, I'll respond to that. Yeah, so okay. <laughs> quantitatively, it's something like 99.99%, right? So well. if you look at the, we put out some of the numbers, I don't have all of them, but the, the percentage of activity of discussion around the US election that was controlled by, by Russian bots or other disinformation yeah. actors is a tiny, tiny fraction. So I, that doesn't mean it's not important, but we do have to, there are quantitative numbers here, and those quantitative numbers are important. Like, you know, $100,000 in ads is about our ad revenue f in 30 seconds, right? So like, you know, compared to hundreds of millions of dollars in ads that were run overall in the election. So it, that doesn't mean that these aren't important things to fight, but we also have to keep it in, this is one of the reasons this is a, a difficult issue because these are literally needles in the haystack, you know, okay. of, you know, one part in 100,000 or one part in a million that we're looking for that bad activity compared to all of the positive activity. Okay, then, as I've said, then it's probably my specific echo chamber. But the question I wanted to ask is... Uh, we well, nobody writes a story about the, the <laughs> tens of billions of pieces of content that we're not 
You yeah. should create well, a yeah. fake profile and pitch that story to a few media. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, <laughs> what I wanted to ask, uh, we run our own machine learning system for about two years on trying to find the bots online related to the Russian activity. And right. for instance, on Twitter, uh, in the area of uh, Russian language space talking about NATO in Estonia. One and a half year ago, when we first did the analysis, we came back with the number of 87% of the content in that parameter space coming from bots and only 13 uh, of humans. Is that big problem in these niche areas only for Twitter or you would see there's a kind of a same issue with Facebook? I mean, we have very different problems at Facebook than Twitter. Twitter is a very different platform. Yeah, sure. Right? Uh, I mean, there's three big differences between us and Twitter. First is a pseudo anonymity, right? So Twitter allows you to be whoever you are, you want to be. Um, whereas on Facebook, we don't have that problem. That's closer to Instagram, where Instagram, we don't have as strict rules. The second is you can post on Twitter via API. So when you post on Facebook, it is either from our JavaScript running your browser or our mobile application, which means the amount of data we have to determine whether or not you're a bot is actually much richer yeah. than if you're just accepting posts via API. And the third is just the scale of the companies is quite different, and so we have more resources to throw at it. I, I think from our perspective, it, a smaller number of people are getting more reshares on Facebook, so the percentage of account, the number of accounts is much, much smaller, but the, they have been effective in getting people to reshare, 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 and to get that multiplier effect. On Twitter, they're trying to do it through brute force because they have the capability of doing brute force, of creating tens of thousands of, or hundreds of thousands of accounts. Um, the question is, is what actual effect does that have, right? If you have 100,000 bots, all of which are only followed by other bots, and you can, you can poison the hashtag, but other than poisoning the hashtag, most of that content is disappearing into the ether. And so it's, it, I think this is one of the issues we have in the study that I think we need to fix through sharing data is we need to have better quantitative metrics around the impact of how many people read something. You know, we, we have all kinds of ways of measuring do people really read something or just look at it for a second. Those are the kinds of metrics we need to measure, not just the prevalence of the amount of content overall, but how many human beings it, it impacts, if that makes sense. Well, thank you very much. I would then still note that obviously whoever would be the opponent or trying to reach Facebook obviously is a much more offers much more reward if you get your operations ongoing in your space. Right. Now, can I turn to audience and ask uh, whether there are uh, the questions uh, for the panel? Uh, while you, yes, there is one back in there. Um, hi, uh, thank you for a fascinating panel. Uh, my name is Nick Roguski. I'm an uh, international lawyer uh, in Krakow. And I have a question to uh, Mr. Giels and, and Mr. Stamos, because uh, you have talked about um, you know, corporate social responsibility in um, you know, fighting the, the misuse of platforms, uh, but you noted that uh, this is a moral and ethical obligation rather than a statutory one, and you didn't take a position on whether this should be a statutory uh, reg or regulated by law rather than by you know, just um, self-regulation, and I would be interested in hearing your views on, on whether states should regulate. Uh, thank you. Okay, fine. First of all, I'm not a lawyer, and I would not want to be taken for one. So this is a, <laughs> <laughs> this is a concerned citizen opinion rather than a legal opinion. Um, I would hope that it would be possible for the social media platforms to detect sufficiently that it is in their own interests to self-regulate to head off these threats, that state intervention was not necessary. However, I'm also very much aware that there may come a point at which if the social media platforms do not self-regulate fast enough and the threat develops to a point where that airspace analogy becomes far more cogent, then there might be a requirement for urgent intervention by states to take control. Because after all, the model that we're talking about is not a universal global one. It is one that pertains in Western liberal democracies. Consider other countries around the world which have already made this decision and would like ideally to reshape organizations like Facebook and Twitter in the same way as they have uh, dealt with social media in their own information space. That's one of the key elements in the self-interest of social media platforms in protecting themselves against this. Alex? 
Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I completely agree. One of the, the majority of our users either do not live in democracies or live in democracies that do not have established rights of free speech, right? And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how to protect voices in countries while also being as compliant as possible with local law. And that is a constant battle at all the tech companies. Um, and uh, I think that needs to be considered by well-respected Western democracies when they pass content restrictions of how does that exact law look when translated into a different language. Um, I think if, if countries want to start somewhere, I think the place where there's the most legal ambiguity is around uh, political advertising in mm -hmm. almost every country in which we operate, we're applying laws that were written for newspapers or television ads to the online sphere, um, and they're just not relevant. So we support the Honest Ads Act in the United States of to try to clarify what are the rules that we should enforce. Right now, we're, we're making up as we go along, we're making our own rules. That only works for us, and that means all of the other platforms that operate in these countries will be all of the you know, illegal advertising will be moving to them. They will be arbitraging uh, you know, over to those platforms. And so there probably should be a legal baseline uh, that is agreed to of what is allowed political advertising um, and what you're allowed to do from a targeting perspective as a political advertiser. That, that really hasn't been defined almost anywhere in the world uh, for the social media space. Well, Alex, would it be also fair to say that uh, in some cases regulation can provide a self-inflicted injury? What's been the effect of GDPR, for example, on your aspiration to share data with academics who are studying the problem? Um, so it's an interesting question, uh, Mr. Giles. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, the first, anybody who predicts what, what GDPR in any way is going to do is, uh, nobody can provide a firm prediction because nobody knows what GDPR means yet, right? The, the, the rules are written intentionally vague. And while we have had people who've been working on GDPR for 18 months and working with the, the Article 29 working group and with the DPAs, we are doing the best we can to be compliant, but we, you know, nobody knows what it is to be compliant. And there will be years and years of 28 DPAs making decisions, and then lawsuits in 28 countries, and then whatever happens in Luxembourg before we know what GDPR means. So I, I don't think we can make a prediction yet. I will say I think there's two things in this area you have to watch for GDPR. First, GDPR, the first victims of GDPR are gonna be the major European publishers, right? Because mm -hmm. if you go to any major U European newspaper, they have dozens and dozens of third-party JavaScript includes that power their advertising networks. I don't know under the current interpretations how those possibly could be made compliant with GDPR consent that there are 27 JavaScript includes from 27 different parties around the world for me to read. And so if, this, if GDPR means that more and more quality journalism ends up behind paywalls, I think that could be a bad thing for our societies because we don't want only rich people getting good journalism and the middle classes getting clickbait, right? And so that's, that's one thing we have to watch. And then the other is GDPR is going to have an impact on the ability of the platforms to police the platforms and, and also to provide data, not just of the directly sharing, but also we can't provide data that hasn't, um, that we don't have, right? And one of the interesting things to me is it, it does seem like the national security realm was not part of the GDPR process in the <laughs> last couple of years. Um, and so now we're gonna have a reckoning where people who only care about privacy who have not been balancing the equities of the people in this room. And now these equities are gonna be have to balanced out after the law is written. And I'm not sure how that's going to work. Um, but it's, you're gonna wanna get involved because data we don't have, we can't provide and data we don't have, we can't use to do this kind of stuff. You saw that cluster I put up. Again, don't know where GDPR is going. There are futures where we no longer have the ability to do that because the data that is used to do that clustering was either never gathered or was thrown away within days. Um, also, we are in an adversarial situation. Anything that is, any right that is given to somebody who says they are European to wipe out their own data is going to be gamed by these adversaries, right? They will bounce off a VPN. They'll say they're from the Netherlands or from wherever. Mm -hmm. They will say, wipe out all my data. They'll do so in a selective way specifically to make it hard for us to do these investigations. And so there, there is a balancing act here of if you tell the platforms we can't know about people, then we will not be able to police this kind of activity. Um, and that's how things are gonna swing. Um, same with the use of machine learning. A lot of stuff we do right now is uses machine learning. If we don't have the ability to use machine learning to do, do this work anymore, then our ability to police at 2.2 billion user scale is gonna be significantly decreased. Well, I think that actually uh, brings uh, uh, one particular problem with the regulation. 
is whatever regulation happens, it is going to be lagging behind the real technology possibilities. I remember being part of the Latvian EU presidency debating and discussing the uh, GDPR. You're right, security was not at all on the table at that point. President Ilvas, you have a question. Uh, can we have a mic here? Yeah. Just two brief comments. One is that uh, I've been to about 20 of these panels in the past uh, year and a half, and this is by far the best and most sub substantive, so thank you to all who did it. And then a another comment, basically, uh, to Keir, I don't want to get into it now, we can talk about it later, but I have a feeling that since 2006, with first the mobile phone coming, having massive distribution, coupled with the rise of social media that was actually fueled by the mobile phone so that you had these huge audiences, that in a modern democracy, in the digital era, you, you can't have anonymity. You can have democracy mm -hmm. and, uh, and no anonymity, or you can have anonymity, but what we have seen means that democracy is going to be under severe threat, and as much as I love Darth Putin, um, <laughs> I, and I tweet him all the time, and in fact, I tweeted him right now because uh, Bill Browder was arrested today by the Spanish police huh. while during this panel. But I don't think that anonymity is compatible with democracy, and ultimately, and the argument, the other argument that, well, what about authoritarian states? You need anonymity there. That's fine. Liberal democracies, no. And the authoritarian states, they know who you are, even if you have... Uh, an anonymous name. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the comment. Can I add uh, two things? Yeah, please, Camille. Yeah, I, I thank you for, for this comment. I, I, I tend to personally disagree and I worry a lot about uh, where we're going as a result of uh, reacting to these disinformation campaigns. And I think that one of the end goal of those coordinated uh, campaigns led by authoritarian regimes was to lead us there. And to give you a specific example, um, back to Turkey again, I think of the Turkish protest that just happened three weeks ago. Um, there was a spontaneous uprising on social media of citizens who wanted to uh, take it to social media to discuss their uh, opposition to certain government policies. And it was the type of social media movement that I believe we all value and want to encourage and want to see continue to happen on social media. That included anonymous accounts, pseudonymous accounts, human rights uh, activists who are, uh, were making uh, important statements, uh, investigative journalists. And the way the government reacted to this, of course, was to say, hey, look, there are some pseudonymous accounts in there. I don't believe that this is a grassroots protest. I believe that this has been probably organized by bots and trolls, and it's probably actually organized from abroad. And from a personal perspective, this was the first time I was doing network analysis on a movement to demonstrate that it was actually not bots and trolls, and that the part that was coordinated from abroad was actually very small and uh, insignificant compared to the rest of the movement. But I, I believe that the idea of us constantly doubting social media, doubting grassroots protests, doubting spontaneous activity, and turning a negative eye on pseudonymous activity, uh, anonymous activity was also part of the plan and is a reaction that we should uh, be wary of. But again, that's a personal opinion. But isn't that the case, you know, like in a personal relationship? If a person has lied to you once, you're not going to trust it anymore. So next time somebody says he's lied, you're prone to believe it. So if there have been the cases where social platforms have been used in a particular way, it is very easy for right or wrong purposes to claim it and still stake it. So there is a responsibility that is a part of the outcome once you've not, in a social platforms, been able to protect the integrity of process, then down the line, so many actors can use it. We have a question uh, over there. Uh, hi, my name is Brady. Um, I'm a security consultant from Brooklyn. This is for Mr. Stamos. I'd also be happy for the other three of you to chime in. Uh, my first question is, uh, 
whether uh, you think Facebook should be subject to the same types of regulation that other political messaging in the United States is under the Federal Election Commission, and if not, why not? Uh, my second question is, should we trust software engineers and profit-driven tech entrepreneurs to assume a counterintelligence mantle? And if the answer is yes, why? Um, and my last question is, do you think there are a priori reasons not to store uh, or rather, yeah, do you think there are a priori reasons not to store high resolution psychological profiles of say like billions of people, say like a vast majority of citizens in liberal democracies? And I'm asking, when I say a priori, I mean like from a liberal democratic perspective. Um, if you don't think there are a priori reasons not to store that data or monetize that data or let commercial entities that could be front say for foreign intelligence services purchase the data, um, if the answer is no, why? So. Three oh. questions, sorry. So, okay. so, so counterintelligence mantle, please. regulation, <laughs> and uh, uh, psychological profiling. Right, so, so like I said on, the, on number one, we support the Honest Ads Act in the U.S., which would clarify the FEC rules. What we're doing on ad transparency is well above what is legally required. We believe the bar should be raised, so all the comp all, everybody who does it has to do that. I think the other thing there is people need to consider regulation around what campaigns are allowed to do from a targeting perspective. Um, when you think about the Cambridge Analytica issue, there's a bunch of different issues there, but one of the interesting ones is uh, should you be allowed to use large data sets that you purchase for targeting the voters? Every campaign has done this mm. on both sides. It, it's being, there's a lot of selective outrage that's going on right now. Mm. If, if that's not something people want, then the law has to be passed to disallow people from campaigns from doing it. Um, on the second, I'm sorry, what was this? Counterintelligence. Counterintelligence. Why should we trust you to do counterintelligence? Well. So uh, not you, sorry, I, I, Zuckerberg, really. You're, I, I have nothing but love for you, so. Yeah. Well, no, well, I appreciate that. I, um, well, I, this comes down to, there's a, Keir had a very interesting point, which is, why do we do what we do? And so far, the things we have done as a company have been highly reactive to acute damages that have been caused by stuff that we now know happened on the platform. Right? I think we are in the place, now that we have closed the barn door, as some people uncharitably put it, um, to now have to rethink what, what are our motivations and in what context should we operate? And so I don't have a great answer for you because I think this is a totally new area. We have 2.2 billion users. As I said before, many, many, many of those users, probably well over a billion of them, live in countries that are not free countries. And we are providing them with voice and freedom that they would not be allowed by their country overall. And so, like, we can't just have some a rule like we're just gonna follow the law everywhere. We also have to make sure that we're being respectful of different cultures and being respectful of legal regimes around the world. And the mixture of what is our responsibility to individuals, what our responsibility to nation states, both democratic ones and non-democratic ones, um, what should we do versus governments? There's no good thesis of that. Right, and, and we're in this weird kind of pre-Westphalian moment of defining who does what in this world. Right now, the platforms using the data that we already have to police standards that we, that we transparently talk about and that we, have a, we put a good faith effort behind, I think is the best solution. I think that is a better solution than us dumping out billions of peoples of data to even democratic governments. I think it's a better solution um, than us enforcing speech restrictions in an unlimited fashion in every country around the world. And so we're, we're trying to come up with standards that are appropriate across the world. We're trying to come up with standards that define what undo foreign and domestic influences. Um, and if not us, I don't know who. And so that's what we're offering off right now. But I think you're right. This is gonna be a fascinating question for the next five years is under what theory are we taking these actions and what empowers us and what should those limits be? Because I also, I think there need to be limits on the speech restrictions we do. Um, and this is, this is one of the real conflicts we get out of critics of social media right now is the most common criticism we get is you guys are too powerful and that power should be used to squash my enemies, right? <laughs> and the, you, you, you don't really want both of those things. Um, like, and there needs to be kind of constraints that we think about of how far will the large tech platforms go to control, to define what is the Overton window of appropriate speech, especially political speech in any society, and whether we should enforce it or not. And I think, you know, this has started with things like Nets DG and stuff. I think that's the wrong direction. But at least we've started to have this discussion because of those laws. Uh, and I, you know, I, hopefully in five or six years, we will have a better understanding of what position we all play. Um, and the third, I, 
I think there's a lot of misinformation, honestly, about how high profile, uh, high resolution our targeting capability is. Every capability you have to run an ad on Facebook, anybody can use. And so the first thing, if, if, if you, I recommend anybody wants to criticize our data collection policies or our advertising policies, go put a credit card, I mean, this is a little self-serving, but give us a credit card number and go run $5 of ads. And you will see all of the exact same capabilities that everybody has. Um, and you will find some of them are not as great as you might have assumed. <laughs> the, when you think about a lot of the targeting that's happening though from, from people that we don't like doing the targeting since you came to Analytica, it's based upon data that's coming from elsewhere. So like I said, I think pol could legal control around what kind of data you're allowed to buy and to use in hyper-targeting has nothing to do with our, that has nothing to do with our, any psychological profiles. It all has to do with people bringing lists of users to us. Um, that's the kind of thing that there needs to be democratic debate about what's allowed and what's not. No, sure. My question though is like, do we, should we store it? I mean, okay. okay thank you. Uh, that was a great discussion, but we're run out of time. Okay. Uh, and uh, I just uh, want to quickly say, it was a great uh, panel to chair. I think we've uh, concluded that we still try to think about what happens rather than thinking ahead and thinking ahead is going to cr be critical to solve the problem. The fact that people are trying to influence other people is nothing new. The fact that the technology allows it is a new, and that is going to be persistent feature, that there'll be new and new fields, and to muster that, we have to cooperate across governments, platforms, non-governmental, and also uh, media players. With that, thank you, Alex, Camille, and care. Thank you.